All right, so we're going to talk today. Well, I guess at first, and given I should make a disclaimer, I didn't know Cameron was going to go there. Uh, I have not consulted with Daniel and or Ephraim because obviously they're not here, but I think HFF's official policy is uh, no love with your cousin. So um, you can say hi, you can hang out at gatherings, but anything above and beyond that, completely unacceptable uh, as far as our policy. We don't take a lot of policies, but that's one I think we're going to go ahead and just tow the party line on. That's not, not acceptable. Um, Although I am driving through Kentucky. Too far? I know. Father, forgive me. All right. It's okay to laugh, right? I laugh at myself all the time, every day. It's fun. Joy. A little bit more joy in our life. That was a commercial back when I was a child. I digress. We'll get into the main message here some point in time. We're going to talk about, once again, because it just seems to be where, where the Father's got my studies right now, we're going to talk about another fairly deep topic today uh, called Satan Needs Permission. Now, I tried not to do like the whole like Halloween masks and like all the like super like dark things in it because ultimately, and I won't give away the end, uh, my, the end of the message, but ultimately I believe that there is a reason why the Lord, why God, why Yahweh, why Adonai allowed for the adversary multiple adversaries in scripture to be created. Uh, one thing that we should always remember is that the adversaries were created, created, created. Use that word over and over again. So if you've been a believer for any amount of time, I'm sure you've heard statements like Satan made me do it or the devil made me do it or not today. Satan, Satan's trying to get up all in my business. Like, that's one I hear a lot, you know, um, normally by people in their 30s, because the people who are in high school and college don't talk that way anymore. I can't even speak your lingo. Um, or the devil's trying to get me down. Like, I've heard that one a lot. Um, one of my personal favorites is, we have to resist the devil's plan for our life. See, I've heard all of those numerous times on a regular basis, but... I think we're giving the adversary more credit than, and more power than God has ever granted him. So let's take some looks at some of the traits of our creator, Adonai Elohim, and how they might either be similar or contrast to the adversary. Because a lot of times people will say that, that Hasatan, the Satan, the devil, the adversary, whatever name you want to use, whatever title you want to use for that person, a lot of times they will say that, that well, he is, is the complete opposite of God, or he is God's counterpart, and they won't define that. And so a lot of times you'll have people say, well, the devil's out there floating around the earth and has all this power, and he's doing all these things. And it almost makes it sound like the devil is is omnipresent, that the, the devil has some of these same traits that Adonai has. And the scripture just simply does not back that up. Uh, it doesn't. And so God is all powerful, but Satan's power is limited. And I'm going to say Satan a lot, but know that in the scriptures, especially throughout the Hebrew scriptures in the New Testament, there's a lot of Satans. There's a lot of Satans. There's a lot of adversaries the adversary, adversaries. There's a lot of times that go on where there are things that happen that we give credit to this one unified being, the devil, the, the Satan, Hasatan. And that's not necessarily true. So sometimes there are other adversaries that, that are in there and it's not the Satan that is uh, kind of from the Christian mentality that we, we've been taught from the church. Scripture just doesn't back up that, that, that statement. So every time it talks about the adversary of the devil, it's not necessarily talking about the devil. So... And my guess is he's also not like red with a pitchfork and like all these kind of things too. So, um, you know, he's trying to keep it all in context by the scripture. God is everywhere present. However, Satan, the scripture does not say that he can be everywhere at once. God is all-knowing, both of the heart and of the mind. Satan doesn't know everything. Satan's power and what he knows and can read and see is limited. God was not a created being. Let me repeat that. Elohim of Israel, the Hebrews' God, was not a created being. Never was. He was the creation. Everything has been created out of him. Everything. The chairs you see were created out of him. Because if you trace it all the way back, there was him. So, in order for there to be an adversary, he had to have been created by the one who all creation came out of. So, God was not created. 
Satan, or the adversary, was created. So, while the Bible does mention that there's different types of Satans or adversaries, it also mentions multiple times that Satan is not the primary source of our trials and tribulations. In fact, most of the time when Israel is going through trials and tribulations, it is because of their own behavior, their own decisions. So going all the way back to the start where he said, Satan made me do it, or the devil's trying to get me down, the scripture actually makes more of a point in case that we are the ones trying to get ourselves down, and we are the ones who made ourselves do it. Now there is times in which the adversary is, is involved, and we'll get into some of those traits and some of those situations here in just a moment. But as a whole, the majority of the time when Israel is going through trials and tribulations, it isn't because the adversary is out to get them roaming the earth looking for you and me and looking to try to trip you up. No, in fact, most of the time we're doing just a fine job of doing that on our own. We didn't wake up in the morning on the wrong side of the bed and start an argument with our spouse because the devil made me do it. No, we made ourselves do it. The devil didn't make us go get into debt to buy a fancy car. The devil didn't do this. The devil didn't do that. We did. We made the decision. We made a conscious effort to make the decision. Now, maybe we had some influences in our life that were not great. That's very possible. Israel is accused of doing the same thing throughout the scripture. In fact, one of the worst things that Israel could do was to have other idols, other customs, other traits of other countries, other people, other gods intertwined with their life. When you do that, it's very easy then to get off course in your relationship with the God of all creation. It's, uh, it's going to happen. But if you don't get anything else out of this teaching today, it is, is that we must take accountability for our own actions. Not trying to pass it off on the devil, not trying to pass it off on the adversary. We lack in our modern culture, especially in the United States of America, we lack the ability to stand up and take accountability for our own actions. In fact, then pride, ego, arrogance get involved. We double down and we say whatever we got to say to prove that we're right. We're not actually seeking out a lot of times where we might be wrong. And so rather than becoming a community of people who are there to build each other up, who are supposed to have their gifts and their talents, just like Israel was, there was 12 tribes. Every tribe had a unique gift and responsibility. And they were held accountable based upon those. And when Israel would fall, when Israel would have problems, it was because the community as a whole would not do what they were supposed to do. And then they would turn on one another. We must be accountable to those things. We must hold ourselves to higher standards. We must seek that when we use judgment inside our community to try to do so as righteously as possible. None of us are perfect. None of us have the ability to be a pure righteous judge. Only God does. But as we're attempting to make decisions and we're attempting to go, this is why wisdom and discernment are so important. Knowledge, knowledge is changing so rapidly right now that it doesn't matter how many books you read, you can have all these very, various different perspectives on what's happening and what's going on and what's there. And it's just that. It's varying different perspectives on knowledge. Now, I believe that was going on during the times of the Israelites as well and then throughout all the different cultures that were there. This is why wisdom and discernment are important. Because wisdom and discernment are granted through the power of the Holy Spirit from the Creator for us to be able to interpret things in the proper manner. Not the one that fits us the best, but the proper manner. And it teaches and allows us to grow. Wisdom is something that I think all of us uh, could definitely use more of and would be better off having. So today I want to I look at a little bit about what the Bible has to say about the extent of of Satan or the adversary's power. And how we as believers maybe have create, created some fake news, some false narratives. We maybe deleted some emails on some servers. We maybe did some stuff we weren't supposed to do on this. And yes, I know I got to put my glasses on. I'm getting a little bit older. Man, the 30s have been rough on me. Whew. Wow, 30s have been rough. 
Everybody who's older than 30 is like, that guy has no idea. He has no clue. It's okay to laugh, right? Especially when you're talking about a deep topic. So, Number one, Satan approaches God as a subordinate. Not as an equal. As a subordinate. And I'm going to try to hit through these really quickly because I'm not going to try to keep you super long today. And I got a bunch of points. So I'm going to try to read these super quick. If you need these references again, um, by all means, come see me afterwards. I'll get them to you. Otherwise, I can post them up on uh, the Facebook live stream or on the website later for you. Job 1.6. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Job is a fantastic book if you want to know because the adversaries are used throughout scriptures in a lot of different places. The apostles talk about them. Obviously, some of the more famously known things are Yeshua cast demons out into pigs and things like that, things that were unclean. But Job is a book that speaks a lot about the interaction of the Satan, the adversary, and our creator. And so it is a very good book, and a lot of times the, the question is about Job and Job's relationship to God and why God would, would go and he would challenge Job and he would test Job. And I know that a lot of times that's, that's where a lot of the focus is on Job. But it, if you really want to know about the traits of the adversary, there's a lot of the traits of the adversary in the book of Job. And if you look and you're looking for it, it's very interesting to see that he's not what we have made him out to be. Now, he's not good. Don't, don't take that line and clip that line out of a teaching and say, see, I told you Chris is pro-devil now. Not at all. Disclaimer, I'm not. But he definitely does not have the power and the authority of our creator. And a lot of times we, we walk around and act like he does. He can be everywhere at once. He knows our thoughts. He can be interacting with us. He just doesn't. He approaches God, Elohim of Israel, he approaches God as a subordinate in Job. So he is not God's equal. He is not another God like God. He is a subordinate. He is the assistant manager who is in, responsible over the fries. He is a subordinate. Number two, Satan needs God's permission to tempt. Satan made me do it. Or the devil's trying to get me down. Well, I believe Satan needs God's permission to tempt you. Let's look at Job 1.12. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Let's look also at Matthew 4, 1. Then Jesus, Yeshua, was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. It was the Spirit that led our Messiah up into the wilderness to meet with the devil. It was the Spirit that said, God's great. Everything he does has an ulterior motive. There's something a part of his plan. He didn't just say, today I'm going to wake up and I'm going to go pick a fight with the devil. No, everything that Messiah Jesus did was empowered by Yahweh Elohim for a greater purpose. The whole redemption of all of his people, all believers. Well, same thing with Job. Job had to go in and enter the Lord to get permission to go after his servant Job. Number three, Satan cannot influence nature without permission. We're going to go right back into Job 1.12. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has in your power, only upon him put not forth your hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. While he, a servant, was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven and has burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to you. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young man, and they are all dead. And I only am escaped alone to you. So even after God has granted the adversary permission to go down and to operate in the world, it is God who sent the destruction before him. It is God. It said the fire from heaven. Satan does not control the fire from heaven. Satan is not the king of heaven. He was cast out of the heavenly realm. So the fire was sent down from heaven. That was sent down by the creator of the heavens and the earth. So a lot of times we talk about, you know, what's Satan's power? The destruction that came there was because God gave the destruction. It was God who ordained that. Now, obviously, 
in this whole situation, for those who have read the book of Job, we understand why God was doing that, why those things were happening. But again, if you break it down by the individual things that happen, it is God who has the power. Satan must have the permission. Satan cannot cause physical harm or kill without God's permission. Now, this is a tricky one because there are scriptures that talk about that, that he has the power over death. But he cannot cause physical harm or kill you without the permission of God. So Job 2, 2 through 6. Then the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on all of the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still persists in his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him for no reason. Then Satan answered the Lord, skin for skin, all that people have, they will give to save their lives. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you. To your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well, he is in your power. Only save his life. So Satan had to ask for the Elohim of Israel, the creator of all the earth, to touch him to cause problems. And even after this interchange between the adversary and the creator, he says, Very well, you can go touch him. Very well, you can go do as you wish, but you must spare his life. So once again, he only has the authority that the creator grants him to have. Satan cannot force you to do anything. Acts 26, 17 through 18. I got to scroll down here. I was going to blow up the, the words a little bit more, all the scripture references in there, but then I figured then I would have to step even further back from the prescription. It's tough getting old. Acts 26, 17 through 18. To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance amongst those who are sanctified by the faith in me. This shows Satan has no authority unless God gives him the authority. Satan doesn't know your heart. 1 Kings 8, 39. Then here in heaven, your dwelling place, forgive, act, and render to all those whose hearts you know according to their ways. For only you know what is in the heart of every human being. Now, there's, there's an interesting element to this, too, that, that I think is important for us to look at. And that is, is that there's also scripture references where Jesus, Yeshua, knew what was in the heart of man and what the person was thinking. This is another reference throughout Scripture where it ties Yeshua as being God. So for those people who run around and teach, and it is very prominent in this world, that Yeshua was a mere man. He was not divine. He was not God created in the flesh. Well, if Yeshua was a mere man and a man had the ability to know what was in the heart and know what was in the mind of a person, well, then that means that God is not the only one who has that ability. Which means then Satan would also have to have that ability and all other creation would have to be. Because why would a mere man, why would this one mere man, if Yeshua was not divine, if he was not of God, why would he have powers that no other person has? We know that the, the God of Israel, he does not change, he does not make it up as it goes along. This isn't just some like he's rolling the dice to see what the answer is going to be. So why then would he give one man power over something that he's given not even the adversary power over? I don't believe he has. This is just another one of those God wink moments to show you that Yeshua is of God. He is divine. It's beautiful how God interweaves these writings. Thousands of years, multiple languages, multiple translations different to still point out these beautiful elements of just how awesome he is. Psalm 94, 11 also is another reference you can have where it talks about the Lord is the only one who knows your thoughts. 
I kind of like those slam dunks. Like, he's the only one who knows your thoughts. And last, last of one of my, my main points on the traits of Satan for today is he's a coward. James 4, 7 says that if you are subject to God and you resist the devil, that the devil will flee. So if you, as believers, are subject to God and you resist the urge to entertain the devil, the devil will flee. It doesn't say the devil cannot hurt you. It doesn't say that the devil can't interact with you. It says he's going to run away from you. Well, you're not, it's not like you're picking a fight with the devil. It's not like you're saying, like, let's go toe-to-toe with the adversary. You, you're simply saying, I'm resisting you. I want nothing to do with you. And by the resisting of the adversary being covered by God, the creator, he flees from you. He's not this big, powerful, overarching thing that sometimes we hear he is. Again, I'm not minimizing evil. I'm not minimizing the transgression of the Torah or, or the Word of God. I'm not, I'm, that's not what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is we can't elevate things that don't have the right to be elevated. We can't put off on the devil decisions we're making. Because it removes us from accountability in the Lord. And it places the burden on an adversary to not come after us. Well, I mean, if the adversary is coming after you, and that is a true statement, then we got some problems. As believers, we, in our Christian churches, in our denominations, we were taught that we are supposed to focus on heaven. Heaven is the goal. In order for us to obtain the life of a Christian, we need to get to heaven. That's where we talk about eternal life. That's where we talk about the goal being. However, throughout Scripture, though, and throughout all of the Old Testament, the concept, even in the days of Yeshua, Jesus, the concept of eternal life started here and started now. Kind of think of it like your best life. Now, I'm not taken away from heaven. I'm not taken away from the heavenly realm because Hebrews talks about that. There's a lot of talk about going up and coming down. So obviously there's another realm. I think it's beyond most of our comprehension, and I don't think it's really any of our business. God will reveal that to us in the time by which he wants to reveal that to us. But a lot of times when we first became believers, our thought was about escaping and going someplace else. It was, it was this that we were focused on. However, throughout Scripture, we're talked to, it's more talking about what we do now, what we live now, how we act now, what we're doing for the kingdom now. It's not just like, well, we can do whatever we want to do. And like the thief on the cross, we'll just say to Jesus on our deathbed, Father, forgive me. And poof, we're there. No, he's asked us to do things in this life. He's given us the apostles and the writings and the Torah and all of the prophets in order to show us how we're supposed to go about our life every day. And just like the adversary, we have been giving powers. And I'm not talking, you know, I've been doing a lot of Thanos references. I'm not talking we're going to put some stones in the thing and we're inevitable. I'm not talking about old school Mighty Morphin Power Rangers where we all have a ring and we put it together and we morph into some sort of like whatever. That's not what I'm talking about. We've been given powers through the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Whatever translation it is that you're, you're using. Those powers are the same ones we saw the disciples in Yeshua exhibit in the New Testament. They're the ones that healed, cast out demons, all of these different things. We have those powers, but we don't hear a lot about them right now. And in fact, most of the ones we hear about, we're extremely skeptical because it's a very big business for a lot of prosperity teachers. Wave a jacket, 10,000 people fall down, and all of a sudden they've been healed from multiple sclerosis. Now, I'm not mocking them, but I'm saying in the days of Yeshua, that was not how these things happened. And so we are right to be skeptical. But we were given powers just like the adversary was given powers. We were given things to do just like the adversary was given what he can and cannot do. The question for us, though, is, Are we using our powers like God instructed us and the early apostles to do so? Are we using our powers just like Satan did to rebel against God and build his own kingdom? 
Let's be honest, that's what Satan did. That's what the Satan did. He rebelled against God. He thought he was bigger than God. He was stronger than God. He was smarter than God. And the powers that God gave him when he created him, he used for his kingdom, not for God's kingdom. So let me ask you, are you doing the same thing? We all have gifts. We all have powers. God knows every hair on your head. Are you building your kingdom or are you building his? Because if we're building our own kingdom, then we are guilty of the same thing that the adversary did. Took his gifts, took his, took his powers, and used them for his glory, his sustainability, his ego, his pride. Now we all are in the United States of America. It's one of the most prosperous countries in the history of the world. It is very easy for us to get caught up in the gifts that God has given us when we were born for our own good. For our own kingdom. It's very easy for us to do. In fact, it's almost second nature. The American dream, all these other things. The American dream is to have a house and a white picket fence. Two kids and a dog. Nothing wrong with that. It really isn't. I'm not sitting here like, oh my gosh, do I have to go sell my house today? No. But that's not what the Bible says should be the dream or the goal. The goal and the dream should be to help usher in the return of Messiah on this earth by sharing the love of Yeshua with everybody that we know. So before we go giving the adversary, the devil, all the credit, let's stop and think for one second. Are we creating our own struggles? Is it actually the devil? If it is actually the devil who is causing us struggles, then we must prayerfully look at why God would grant the devil permission to cause us those struggles. Now, it could be that he's testing and growing our faith. Absolutely. That's very possible. Or it could be, according to the scripture, that we truly are not God's. We're not his chosen. We're not his people. That's a scary thought. If we're walking around saying we're believers and we're keeping the commandments of God and we're honoring God, in Scripture's two main places and why God gives the adversary permission to go. One, he has given him dominion over all the people who are not believers. If you are a believer, you have, he cannot touch you. He can't do anything without the permission of God. So if he is actually working against you, actively seeking against you, then he either has to have permission from God to do so or you're not God's. Those are scary things to think about. I had some long hours sitting in my garage this week in prayer over that very topic, that very thought. Pretty fearful to think that, that if God is not allowing the adversary to test you at that point in time, that maybe I'm not God's and maybe I'm not covered by God. That's a scary thing to think about really will make you spend some time on your knees in conversation with the Lord and asking him, okay, Lord, am I yours? Am I doing what you want me to do? Remember in all things that Satan needs permission. We need to examine our lives and make sure that we are not giving him the permission to operate with us. We need to examine our relationships, and make sure we are not inviting him into our life. Because yes, is there Satanism? Yes, there is. Are there Satan worshipers? Yes, there are. Just like there's worshipers over every god you can think of. The flying spaghetti monster has a following. Actually, a pretty large one too. And I'm being dead serious. I'm not making this up. We have to make sure that we're using the gifts that God has given us for the benefit of his kingdom. If you can sing, sing. If you can woodwork, woodwork. If you can drive, drive. If you can cook, cook. I taught a couple months ago a teaching called A Revolution Without a Pulpit. And I know a lot of my teachings, they don't do anything to pack the house in fact, if anything, I'm, I'm telling you to go out and do things, go out and do things, go out and do things. And obviously that hurts ties and it hurts in having, everybody thinks I have a, we have a mega church. 
and we're trying to build a mega church. Look, we're going to open these doors every Shabbat and, and provide a place for people to have a holy convocation. It's going to happen as long as the Lord wants it to happen. Even when I'm tired, even when Daniel's tired, Stephen's tired, we're going to open the doors and we're going to have a place. But like I said in that teaching, and I said last week, I want to make it abundantly known. If we're not changing lives out there, then this is all a show. If we're not changing lives out there in our interactions, whether it's on the internet, it's in the grocery store, it's with family, if we're not changing lives that are pushing people towards Messiah, then it's all a show and it is worth nothing. Absolutely nothing. Now, when we started HFF, we specifically made sure that none of the, the pastors or the elders took salaries from the congregation. No stipends, nothing. The reason why we did that is because I'm not beholden to any person's pocketbook when I stand here. I'm beholden to the king. Daniel's not beholden to a pocketbook. The Ephraim's not beholden to a pocketbook. We preach and we teach and we share what the Lord is doing in our lives. Same thing with Stephen and Cameron and Dr. Deb and all the guest speakers who come in. You can never put a check in that offering box and I will still eat in my house. The only thing it affects is whether we get to come here or not. So if you think that this model of what we're doing here is about us being able to come in and rah-rah ourselves together and say, yes, yes, we're awesome. But sometimes, yes, that will happen. But sometimes we also need to look at and remember that we give credit sometimes where credit isn't due. And sometimes we do that because ultimately we don't want to take responsibility for what the Lord has called us to do. I've been in the Messianic movement for 13 years. I've worked as an operations manager, a high-level manager for the MIA, for I helped found HRN. I work for Lion and Lamb now. I've run my own music ministry. I've been involved with a lot of the teachers and the people that you know. And I can tell you that we have to take accountability for what we're doing now. It's not just about knowledge. Knowledge is not going to work anymore. God's called us to go do something with what he's given us. He's given us a revelation that not everybody has. He's brought us back to the feasts and to the festivals and to the Torah. Things that not everybody has. Not so that we can go out and judge them for what they don't have. So we can go out and use the gifts he's given us to build his kingdom. We build our kingdom when we're out there talking about how much we know and how much you don't know and how much you're not doing right. We build our own kingdom because ultimately the only thing we're doing is lifting ourselves up on a pedestal. We must go back to having the minds of Messiah, which is love your neighbor as yourself and love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. Because yes, Satan needs permission. Yes, he does. But God has granted him permission for a period of time on this earth. And until Jesus comes back and fights the battle, until that happens, we're hands and feet in that battle right now. Tonight, the Druze will be going to the city rescue mission. Tomorrow, they'll be going to Grace Living Center. Over the next two to three weeks, people will gather in their homes to, to celebrate Christmas. And there will be people who will be sleeping under bridges, on street corners, in trash bags, who don't have hats, who don't have coats. We're not talking about going into our closets, guys. We're not talking about picking out which coat works best for what we have. We're talking about people who don't have a coat. Legitimately might freeze to death. We can stand up for abortion. We can stand up for all these things. But if we're not going to do the things that are right in front of us right now, then we're not combating the permission that the adversary has already been given to operate in this city. 
Sometimes the Lord uses these types of trials to bring his people back to repentance and refocusing. I hope we can refocus on the fact that Satan didn't make you do it. Satan, just like us, needs permission to be able to do the things in this world. So let's not put the focus on Satan anymore. Let's not put the focus on what the adversary is doing. Let's go out and put the focus on what the Lord wants us to be doing in this city. What he wants us to be doing in this state. What he wants us to be doing in this nation. Because then and only then will we see the Lord lifted high in our city. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Shabbat. We thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together to serve you, to worship you, to rejoice before you, to raise our voices and praise you. Father, may we not squander the gifts that you have given each and every one of us. May we learn from the mistakes and the missteps that we have. And may we always be seeking to be guided by the Holy Spirit and the Ruach HaKodesh. Father, you are amazing. You are beyond our comprehension. And so we thank you, Lord, for having mercy upon your people. We thank you, Lord, for working for our good. Father, continue to mold us. Continue to make us into the men and women you would have us be. May we shine the joy of Yeshua to every person that we meet. For it's in the name of Yeshua we humbly come before you today. Amen and amen.